welcome everyone Thank you for coming to our Ask the Experts lecture this Saturday morning. I'm Hannah and I'm a clinical research coordinator at the Movement Disorder Center at BIDMC. And this is part of our Ask the Experts speaker series that we put on a few times per year. Just a brief introduction to Zoom this morning. Uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Benitez. While he's speaking, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box and we will be reading them at the end. Uh, everyone will be muted, so the best way to make a question or comment will be to use the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be turning on the transcription as well, and then this will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel so that you can go back and watch later. We can go ahead and get started. Uh, this morning, we'll be hearing from Dr. Bruno A. Benitez, MD, who is a physician scientist and assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and the Division of Movement Disorders at BIDMC, and he's also an associate member of the Broad Institute at MIT Harvard. He is the director of the biorepository of the BIDMC Department of Neurology. This morning, he will be speaking on human genetics applied to the discovery of novel therapeutic targets for Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Hannah. Um, well, as uh... It's a pleasure to be here with you on a Saturday morning. Thank you for all of you uh, who decided to join us today. Um, as Hannah mentioned, uh, the idea with this talk is to talk about, um, give an update on uh, what's going on in human genetics in Parkinson's disease from the research perspective. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, most of the data that I'm gonna talk about today, it has been published by us and by other um, uh, researchers. Um, most of the funding for the grant is coming from um, NIH, uh, private institutions. I have no connections or funding uh, related to industry and none of the um, data or the um, uh, ideas or the updates they're going to present today has nothing to do with industry. Uh, I set myself three objectives for today. Um, hopefully we're going to meet them. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about genetics, genomics research regarding Parkinson's disease, give you an update where we are currently, what's, um, what has happened in the last 27 years since the discovery of alpha synuclein that changed everything for Parkinson's disease. Um, till last December, where we have some of the latest uh, research coming from uh, uh, large consortiums consortia doing uh, studies in human and, and genomics. I'm going to give you a historic perspective of what have, has been done in uh, Parkinson's disease on genetic-based therapy, uh, what is um, in the works, and what is in the clinic. Uh, there is a lot of research currently on, um, on the preclinical stage, but we are not going to talk about that today. And also, <clears throat> One of the main points that I want to um, emphasize with this talk today is the importance of the patient-based research. Uh, if you're a patient yourself, if you're a provider, if you um, are a family member, uh, the idea with this talk is to uh, give you an overview of what we can accomplish when you participate in research. Um, I hope I accomplished that. Uh, and and then again, as Hannah said, we'll have a a Q&A session at the end of the talk, uh, and I hope you, uh, I can answer some of your, uh, some of your questions at the end. Okay, so um, when we talk about Parkinson's disease, uh, we talk about a, the current definition is a clinical pathological. So clinically, uh, Parkinson's disease is mostly defined by uh, motor, motor symptoms, tremor, rigidity, or the stiffness, uh, akinesia or bradykinesia, which is the slow, a slowness with movement, uh, postural in instability, changes in your, the way that you pose, and also uh, uh, changes with your gait, the way you, the way you walk or the way you uh, or the patient walk. Here's a representation of how uh, many of these symptoms manifest. Uh, it has been demonstrated that there are some symptoms that might be different between patients uh, between um, females and, and males. But for the purposes of the 
def the current definition of Parkinson's disease, we're going to refer to the um, to the motor symptoms. However, in the last ten years, it has been clear that uh, there is a prodromal uh, stage for Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are certain estimates that the, the disease related to Parkinson might start 15, 20 years before the motor symptoms appear. As you can see there, the, the symptoms are non-motor. Um, most of them has to do with the dysfunction of the autonomic uh, ner uh, nervous system, meaning uh, what is outside um, uh, that doesn't compromise just only the brain. So uh, symptoms like uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms or orthostatic hypertension or urogenital dysfunction, those precedes the motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Closer to the closer to the diagnosis, when the disease start manifesting with uh, tremor, for instance, or rigidity, so then we have another collection of symptoms. One of the most um, one of the most studied ones is the impairment of olfaction. So most of the patients start noticing changes in the smell, or they lose the capacity to actually recognize, recognize uh, odors. So another important um, symptom that it's been recognized as part of the uh, pre-motor pre symptoms is sleep disorders, especially the ones that has to do with the, um, with, with the REM. So um, patients that have disturbance in, in, the, um, in the sleep that are now considered to be part of that predominal uh, uh, group of symptoms that might be uh, happening before the motor uh, symptoms happen. So a collection of gastrointestinal symptoms, constipation is one of the, uh, the most common ones, but there is another uh, set of uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms that the patient experiments. Then once the motor symptoms appear, that's what constitute what we call the Parkinsonism, right? So after that, then in the early stages, and then there are symptomatic treatments for to manage those. That's when most of the people uh, go to the neurologist. That's when the diagnosis is made. And then after that, it becomes uh, uh, a progression that depending on who you are and depending on and then again, genetics, or depending on certain context, the 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 um, the progression might be slow. It could last 10, 20 years. There are patients for 25 years with the disease that has been managed. But then another symptoms appear. One of the most common ones of the non-motor symptoms that appear is the cognitive cognitive dysfunction. So patients start to have memory problems. Okay, but um, this is these concepts are global. And this is a definition for that that can that can that you can apply to many uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. And the uh, clinicians, the movement disorder specialists, are really good. So, um, the, with the criteria that the movement, the International Movement Disorder Society established based on uh, previous studies, uh, the correlation between the clinical diagnosis and the findings uh, after the patient's died is almost 80%, 85, even 90% of the clinical correlation once the motor symptoms is started. Now, this has been proven uh, thanks to um, mod mod modifications in the, in the clinical diagnosis. So, but it, it takes time to, to develop the, uh, to, to reach the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Now, when, this is one of the examples I'm, I'm showing you here. This is only one aspect in which we were uh, using a uh, cognitive test among patients with Parkinson's disease in the course of 15 years. The reason I'm showing you this is what we call a, a spaghetti plot, is to show you that each patient is different. And many of you know that. Each patient has a trajectory of the disease. And this is one component. This is one test. If you put all the symptoms together, if you put all the different, we can measure all the different signs that the disease have, we will have uh, charts like this for almost every symptom of the patient. So this leads us to conclude, or what we already know, that Parkinson's disease cannot be one, one monolithic entity. 
there are different components of the disease. There is a disease that is heterogeneous in the progression in the course of the disease, maybe in the cause of the disease as well. So we have been trying to use, combine all these clinical information that is provided and applied as statistical methods, as statistical models to actually try to understand and try to generate subtypes, clusters of you know, patients that we can reduce the heterogeneity that is that is present in, in a group of patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, this is gonna be a constant in the talk. We're using tons of data to try to reduce, on one hand, we wanted to reduce the uncertainty. So we wanted to have a clear diagnosis for the patient. On the other hand, we wanted to reduce the, um, the heterogeneity in the groups of, of patients with Parkinson, different clusters of, of individuals based on multiple um, uh, multiple uh, data. Okay, so as I said, that was the clinical part. Uh, we started with the definition that only includes motor symptoms and also include um, from a, a pathological perspective, the loss of the dopaminergic neurons in a region of the midbrain that is called the substantia nigra. And it's called like that because these are cells that are located in this part of the brain. Um, you can see here in black, these are dopaminergic neurons that are full of melanin. Like it's sort of like the same pigment on the skin, but in this case, um, it's, it's, it's the product of many years of uh, uh, producing certain uh, neurotransmitting molecules, especially dopamine, that then will control the movements. So as you can see here, this is a, a healthy individual uh, that is matched by um, age of these other individuals that have Parkinson at different stages. You can see here how uh, these black spots here reduces in patients with Parkinson disease. And the uh, in C and E, as the disease progresses, then you have less dopaminergic neurons. So uh, the definition of Parkinson includes the symptoms, include the post-mortem. We uh, have evidence that there is loss of um, dopaminergic neurons and also uh, that there is the presence of this, of this um, accumulation or this structure inside the cells. This is the melanin that I was talking, uh, that I was mentioned before, these granules here. This is a dopaminergic neuron. And then there is this structure here that you can see round or brown in this other picture. Uh, these are what we call the Lewy bodies. So definition of Parkinson, motor symptoms, you have loss of dopaminergic neurons, and you have at least one, um, as they said, um, uh, Lewy body in these neurons. Now, as you can imagine, this is a, um, a post-mortem tissue, a post-mortem diagnosis um, in the clinic. And as I said, when you use the, uh, the criteria that is currently used in the clinic and you match with these results, 80, 95%, 80 to 90% of the time, times they match. But nowadays we can use um, the technology that has been developed technologies to actually see this when the patients are still alive. So there are techniques um, in which uh, using um, PET scan, uh, it's a way to imagine uh, uh, the brain. And in this case is the projection from these dopaminergic neurons to another area of the brain called the striatum of the epitome, in which if you see here, this is a, a normal individual, this light up because it's uh, targeting the projections of the dopaminergic neurons. So in a patient with Parkinson, when you start losing these neurons, and then you have less dopamine in this area, this is the, there is a complicated circuit there, which a, a very delicate balance of different pathways that uh, are different circuits that control the movements. So once you lose this uh, uh, balance of the uh, dopamine that is present in this area, that's when the motor symptoms appear. Now, we, 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 we now understand that it's not only dopamine that is effective in the brains of, of, the, of such as patients with Parkinson's disease, but this is a way to see when the patient is alive. It can be used in the clinic, but it's not part of the diagnosis. Since we know now that the main component of this uh, Lewy body is a protein called alpha-synuclein, uh, advances has been done in the last, I would say, uh, 10 years, 
eight years, in which now we can detect it alpha synuclein in multiple uh, parts of the body when the patient is still alive. We don't have to wait till the patient uh, has dead to detect alpha synuclein. This is an example from a, a couple of investigators here at the MC, in which they develop a technique to uh, do the staining of alpha synuclein in the skin with the skin biopsies, as you can see there. So now we can detect it. And then depending on the pattern of the expression, the intensity of the expression, then we can distinguish some of these patients, not only from healthy individuals, but then from other patients that also accumulate alpha synuclein. And then uh, some of you might be familiar with this um, progress. This is the breakthrough uh, biomarker that was announced by the Michael Jessica Foundation last year, and then it, it, it made all over the news. Is a technique that um, that it is it's been in development and it's not fully developed. But this is one of the biggest studies that was published uh, last year, in which uh, they use this um, technique called uh, alpha synuclein seed amplification. So basically, and then I will explain this later. Uh, alpha synuclein changes the X structure or the um, it, it's a molecule that um, it can fold in different ways. Uh, what we call the pathological uh, alpha synuclein, it falls in a way that uh, forms some structures that we call beta sheets. Also, when that uh, a protein that has a, a, a normal conformation touches another protein, alpha synuclein, another uh, molecule of alpha synuclein that is in the normal structure, induces the changes in this protein. So basically, this acid, what it, what it does, it takes advantage of that. Basically, we use a dye that intercalates in this beta sheet structure, and then we can measure the changes. So with time, we have, um, say, um, you can take CSF, cerebral spinal fluid from the patient. You can take a biopsy from skin. You can even take a, a biopsy from the gut. And, and I'll explain why that is important in a minute. You can take uh, uh, many um, uh, um, uh, uh, biospecimens, biofluids from the patient, and then use this technique to detect alpha synuclein. Now, um, as you can see there, is this measure of fluorescence. Um, it's a yes or no, or you can see here, positive or negative, depending on the threshold of each, of each patient. But this has become um, a, a major point of discussion because it can detect, again, alpha synuclein changes in the patient. So uh, compared to the controls, when you combine this information with other uh, data points, then you can distinguish almost, almost 98, 99% of the patients from healthy individuals or individuals with a, a different disease. Together with, um, with the data that I presented you and the understanding that, uh, that the disease doesn't start at the moment that the trauma or the bradykinesia uh, or akinesia starts, uh, there has been uh, a lot of data demonstrating that um, that maybe uh, the changes in alpha synuclein or the changes in the um, in the pathology uh, might come from outside the brain, and this is a hypothesis that has some evidence. Uh, but there is other other uh, investigators or clinicians that think that still the disease starts in the brain and then it spreads uh, to the rest of the body. All right, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so now we have a definition of alpha uh, of Parkinson's disease that includes um, a the clinical component, but also the pathological component. Uh, again, this is almost out of the out of the oven, if you if you will. So some investigators got together and then they started to work on a biological definition, different than the clinical, different than the pathological, but taking points from the progress that has been made in the last uh, five years. So they come up with two classifications. They are complementary. They are in discussion. They are in the research arena. They are, they are not in the clinic yet. But I want you to, to know that this is coming because it takes into account what we can measure from the patients. And then the classification on the one on the, on the left basically includes if we have genetic information, if we can prove that there is accumulation of alpha synuclein, and if we can prove that is neurodegeneration happening, in, in those patients. How do we prove that the genetics? We can sequence many genes, we can sequence the whole genome and prove that you have uh, different variants that are considered at this moment patho, um, 
that causes the disease or it's a high risk for the disease. So that's one way we can do it. The way that we can prove that these patients have accumulation of alpha nucleus is by the methods that I told you, either a skin biopsy or we can do the uh, seed amplification assay. Any other generation, we can prove it with uh, the scans, the PET scans in the brain that you can um, determine if there is changes in the brain, but also measuring certain proteins in the CSF. Now, um, as you can see here, we can um, call, the depending of if you match these of these parameters, if you don't have any genetic uh, variants that we consider um, uh, uh, pathogenic or causing the disease, you will be in this cohort called sporadic. If you have a proof or a pathogenic cause of the disease, then we will call that a genetic disease. And I will show you some examples of what I mean by genetic diseases. There are certain genes that are more important than others or that have effect that have been proven uh, that can cause Parkinson's disease. And then it's a combination of all these different assays. Now, will this help us to, to track the progression? It's just still need to be seen. Uh, uh, is this very specific only of Parkinson's disease or many? There are other neurodegenerative diseases that also accumulate after uh, Might that be the case? It's, it's, it still needs to be seen. As I see, you can see in the publication that is very recent, although it's been in the works in the last years or two. There is another classification that then it doesn't call Parkinson's disease Parkinson's disease because you want it to be more um, inclusive of other uh, diseases that also accumulate alpha synuclein. As I, as I show you, at the end, when the patient die, we can see that there is uh, accumulation of alpha synuclein in the Lewy bodies. But now we can measure in the skin, we can measure in the CSF, we can measure in saliva. So uh, if you're positive for that, and then you start showing, again, symptoms of dop dopaminergic neurodegeneration, either by the PET scan, the imaging that we can take through the brain, uh, we can combine that. So still need to be seen if these changes in alpha synuclein are actually preceding all of these, the symptoms. We have identified or um, patients that are in a phase that we call prodromal. For instance, patients that are having sleep disorders and they do have a positive assay for alpha synuclein. Those are patients that we wanted to follow or that, or, or that the investigators are following and see to, to try to predict if those two uh, combinations might predict who will do uh, the progression to Parkinson's disease. Then again, uh, the disease will progress when they have the symptoms and then not only having symptoms uh, will define these categories. It has to have a functional impact. And by functional impact, me, me, uh, the meaning of that is that um, it's how um, how debilitated it is. If the patient can continue with a normal life or there's some um, uh, other, other changes that need to be done. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, what is causing uh, Parkinson's disease or what we know of the risk factors. Again, when I talk about risk factors, some of these risk factors is probabilities. You might or might not. Or what we have what we have seen, what is coming from the different studies is that if you're exposed to some of these factors, you have an increase of risk or you have a decrease of risk. So again, and many of you probably know this, that there is um, the main risk factor for Parkinson's disease is actually the age. The older you get, the most likely you will get to get Parkinson's disease. There is also um, uh, known that Parkinson's disease is more common in males than in females. And these other um, environmental factors that are uh, that I listed here, they are increasing the risk for the people to develop Parkinson's disease. Now, uh, um, along these different epidemiological studies, we have also identified some of the factors that might be reducing the risk. Um, so, um, and now we are trying to understand what are the, the, the biological uh, uh, mediators of this uh, reduction in the risk. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that some of these factors, risk factors will stay with you your whole life. Some of them you might be exposure, exposed to uh, early or um, uh, at some part of uh, during your, your 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 life, and then here again we come back to the definition of when the disease or the changes in your body will start to develop par uh, Parkinson's disease, or um, or or uh, when you become symptomatic, or when the person becomes symptomatic. Now 
many of uh, these factors and many investigators are working in these different models to try to develop either primary pre prevention, secondary prevention, or symptomatic prevention. So um, not only, and keep this in mind, because this is also a point that I want to emphasize. I mentioned that the risk factors are with you your whole life, but there are also protective factors that are with you your whole life as well. So now, um, one of the uh, also more consistent factors that is associated with Parkinson's disease is the family history. So, and, and then again, this is, uh, there is a family history present in Parkinson's patients only in between 10 to 15% of all the patients. Uh, but this is telling us something. It might be something that is genetics or it might be something that is exposed in the early, you know, in the, in the environment in which these families are located. Okay, so another another uh, piece of the puzzle that told us that maybe this might be something genetics is the twin studies. Initially, um, uh, longitudinal studies that um, combined that were studying identical twins compared to um, non-identical twins show that there is a higher prevalence of concordance of the disease, meaning that with time, patients that uh, if one of the twins the identical twins develop Parkinson's disease, the other one will develop Parkinson's disease, suggesting that it's something genetics because they, they share that, they share the identical genes. It also, um, recent studies have demonstrated that depending on the ethnicity of the patients, you have higher risk than others. Um, all of these combined has given us, has given us a, a, a number that we can quantify in which we call heritability. That is between 27 and 34%. Um, we tried to understand what are the molecular basis of this. And then I'm going to show you some examples. But then again, I want to emphasize that one of the, the, the aspects that's very important in Parkinson's disease is the family, uh, the family history. And here is just um, one example from one of the studies that look at the, um, how, what, what are the odds? How much uh, effect has having a sibling with Parkinson's disease in patients with late onset or early onset. And by late onset is patients that develop Parkinson older than 50, late early onset is early or, you know, uh, 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 lower than 50 years old. So as you can see there, if the, the, the disease started when you're early and you have a sibling or a parent with Parkinson's disease, this is almost eight, eight, eightfold, uh, the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. On averages is almost 3.9, uh, four times. So your chances of develop, again, this is probability. It doesn't mean you can develop, but you're more at risk. So that's why this is something that if you're a, a patient or if you're a, a caregiver, I'm gonna emphasize that this is very important for you. If you have done it, great. If you have not done it, please take the time. Uh, and you can, you know, in one of the gatherings with the family, you can start looking into the family tree, into the family history, what, what runs in your family. What diseases has been present? Um, so I started with you. Uh, this is how we um, uh, typically, this is what a pedigree or family tree looks like. Uh, the, the, the squares are usually males. The, uh, the circles are usually um, females is um, the, the, the ones with the cross for all the people that has already that and it, sometimes we fill this with different colors to indicate that the presence of uh, the disease that we're interested in but we can list, list, as you can see in this example, uh, the age of the patient. We already have the, the gender, um, and then also the diseases or the changes that we, we are interested in. Um, you know, all the diseases that run, and then you'll be surprised. Uh, again, if you if you think or if you have noticed that in your family there are a disease that is it's more common. So this this is very informative, and then again, it's cheap. Sometimes it's just only an awkward conversation with the cousin or with your aunt. Uh, you can do that for Thanksgiving or some other family gatherings. But it's very important. Why? And I'm going to give you some examples of what we have seen in Parkinson's disease. So uh, there is some pattern of, of inheritance that it, it can be very informative. In this case, I'm going to show you something that we call the autosomal dominant. Uh, as you can see here, in this case, blue is the parent that is affected. And as you can see there, 50% of the offspring of the, of the kids might be affected. 
if the mutated gene is there and it follows this, what we call the autosomal dominant. There is another pattern uh, that is called autosomal recessive. As you can see here, um, the, the, the parent is not affected, but he is carrying one of these changes in the DNA. And he can transmit that to the kids. They're not gonna be affected unless they have kids with someone that carries a um, mutation or a change in the same gene. So then their kids will be affected. That's why in the recessive form, in the recessive uh, uh, pattern of inheritance, you skip a generation. It's less common, but it's also, is more prevalent in populations that are geographically isolated or when there is more inbreeding, meaning when uh, cousins or distant cousins uh, 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 have kids. Uh, so, because then these recessive traits or recessive changes, then they become more apparent. Uh, then again, in Parkinson, we are talking about five to 10%, five to 10% um, uh, uh, presentation in this type. There is another one that has been reported in Parkinson's disease. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's called X-linked. Here's, a, in this case, is the dominant form. As you can see there, well, um, uh, the females have two X chromosomes. As you can see here, if the mutated gene is, is in one of those um, uh, chromosomes, and um, a um, son or a daughter out of, out of the, 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 the kids might be affected. Why? Because the, you only need one copy of this mutated gene to cause the disease. So in this case, the daughter would get, um, if this daughter get the mutated um, uh, uh, gene from the mother will develop the disease. Since the, the son um, uh, gets uh, one, chromosome, one X chromosome from the mother, this might also be affected. Now, if the carrier of the um, of this mutation then is the father, then only the daughters will be affected in this pattern because he only passes one X chromosome to them. So, uh, so these are different patterns. They're more complicated patterns, but they will become apparent if you talk to someone, you know, your healthcare provider or a, um, um, a genetic counselor. Counselor. So uh, this may, might become apparent in in in, in the in the families with with any disease, but in this case, Parkinson's disease. So it's important and it's cheap. Well, as I said, some are core conversations only with the relatives. So, um, but then let, let's go to the molecular part of this. So uh, just a reminder, um, the DNA, it's, 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 um, it's located in every single cell in your body. Um, generally speaking, uh, all the cells in your body will have the same genetic um, information, the same genetic uh, code, generally speaking, might be some exceptions to that. So, um, so the, the, the DNA is, is packed, packed in these, uh, in the chromosomes, as you can see here, for, for the purpose of this, we only want to focus on the, uh, on the DNA, but once you unfold that or untangle that, it's very long. So sequences of this uh, DNA, then uh, 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 it's what we call genes. The definition is a little bit more complicated but for the for the purposes of the talk is is a set of the DNA that ended up encoding uh, uh, RNAs and proteins uh, all shapes and sounds. So, but but the, the, again, the genetic information is there. We can get it from sample uh, uh, swap from the from the mouth of skin biopsy. We can get it from the blood, um, isolate the DNA, and sequence the whole genome in a person or in any. Uh, living and not living uh, organism. So this is the way that the chromosomes look like. Uh, uh, so 22 autosomal chromosomes and the, um, the sex chromosomes, the X and Y, y chromosome. Um, thanks to the uh, development or the progress, the technological uh, improvements that, that was done in the uh, late 90s, early uh, 2000s, uh, we, were, we are now able to sequence genomes in I'll, I'll say minutes, um, but you know, uh, but it, it was really an accomplishment that it wasn't that it was done based on the progress that was behind the human genome sequencing project. So these are different uh, milestones that were accomplished, just starting in 1998 and then finishing in 2003 with the first, you know, with the first 2003 marks when we got the first draft of the 
complete, almost complete draft of the human, of the human genome. But along the way, many ch technolo technological changes allow us to do this. And also, and very important, that the cost of sequencing one genome is stopped. Nowadays, you can, you, we started with 100 million or a million uh, and, and, and the price dropped dramatically so that now we can hundreds of dollars and we can get a, the whole genome. But along the way, we also learned tons about the human genome. Uh, and by tons, I mean the size, 3.0 gigabytes, how many genes we have between 20, 18,000, 20,000. We now have an, a, a mean, a medium of the exons. So the, those little regions that, uh, that part of the, the genome, we know how many mutations we can expect per generation. We now, these, these 3.1 billion uh, gigab uh, bases, uh, it's, if, if you think about this as letters, we now know every single letter. We can, we, now we can know every single letter in the genome, thanks to all of this, and we know what to expect in your, um, in your siblings, in your, uh, in your kids or in our siblings, in our kids, we know what to expect, how many changes we expect per person. All of this, it thinks the progress that we make. But once we apply this to the uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, what we have learned, before I go that, I have to mention that there are not only uh, different layers of information that, we, that we're dealing with. So, um, and then I'm just gonna briefly mention this. Um, for the context. Today, I'm just gonna focus on the genomic part, but the understanding of genomics and the, the genomic revolution opened the door to many other small revolutions, meaning technological advances that now we can sequence all the transcripts. So uh, the genome is the, you know, as I said, the, the, the genetic code, but then to actually execute something in the in the cells and in, in the, we need proteins actually who are the execute, executioners of this. And proteins in between, to be there, we have to go from DNA to RNA and then the proteins. And the proteins usually execute uh, all many of their tasks with some intermediary molecules that we call metabolites. But nowadays we can, we can gather information from most of these different layers of information just with one sample from you or from us, from anyone. So the complexity also increases when we go from the, the, the genome to the metabolome. So you can see there, we can start with 20, 18 to 20,000 genes. Then we go to 1,000, 100,000 um, transcripts. Then we go to a million um, forms of proteins. And then we go up to many other uh, metabolites. But now from a single sample, if you provide saliva, urine, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, blood, plasma. We can gather all this information. Going back to Parkinson's disease, as I said, uh, in families, we have detected that um, between five and 10%, 15% of the cases of Parkinson's disease can be attributed to uh, family of Parkinson's disease. How many of those genes we know? On average, between 30 and 35. So this is a list that I put together. Um, some of them, the ones that are here in blue and orange, are the classic ones. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I should have lighted this EPS 35 too. So these are the classic ones. And by the classic ones, I, I mean that they are indistinguishable of clinical, esporadic, idiopathic Parkinson's disease. The other mutations or the other genes that, that also are associated with Parkinson may have something different. It's something that is probably they start when they uh, in the teens, very early, juvenile onset. Maybe there are some um, additional symptoms that uh, in, include some psychiatric symptoms or some other uh, additional uh, symptoms that are not in the core of uh, of the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson. That's what we call atypical Parkinsonism. But many of them are related with what we call uh, the Parkinson um, monogenic forms. So now, now um, there is a there is a an effort, international effort, and you can see here this was a report from last year, in which um, uh, investigators all over the world are trying to identify these families, 
and when I say fa uh, families, it might be uh, two generations affected, the parents and, the, and one kid or two kids, or it might be uh, three generations if we're gonna look for a recessive. But sometimes it's a multi-generational family with many branches in that family tree. So now many researchers all over the world uh, are trying to identify, and this list will likely to grow in the coming years because this just started. So, and then they are already producing results. Earlier, um, most of the uh, uh, investi investigations in Parkinson's were located in, uh, of course, in the US and Europe, but now everywhere in the world, we have different contributions. And we can link them together. Sometimes we can now track where the mutation originated and then with people migrating more to different places. Um, here is just to, to show you in terms of like the age of onset um, and the manifestations of some of these forms of uh, uh, monogenic Parkinson's disease, the genes that are caused, the ones that are very similar to idiopathic, some of them that start, as I said, really or early with also cognitive disability with some other changes that doesn't um, fit in the class uh, definition of Parkinson, but they are contributing to our understanding of what is causing Parkinson's disease. Then again, if you take the time, if you're a patient or if you're a caregiver, if you take the time to do the family tree and you might identify some of these patterns, uh, please talk to your healthcare provider or talk to us. And then we'll put you in contact with the people that is actually, uh, 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 we can do it ourselves or we can put you in contact with the people that are doing um, uh, uh, these uh, investigations at a global scale. That's, but this is the case for genetics causing monogenic Parkinson's disease, five to 10%, as I said, that means that then the other 90 to 95% of the cases, there is not a, um, a monogenic cause of Parkinson's disease that we know. Actually, that's not a, entirely true. One of these genes that recently was identified, um, I believe is uh, NUS1. It was a different experimental design. Again, these are um, early onset Parkinson's disease, but it wasn't that it was part of a family. It's just that many kids in, in, in some region in Japan were having this uh, disease that symptomatically looks again, looks similar. So the investigators sequenced the whole genome or the whole exome and then identified changes in this particular gene. So what they also did was to sequence the parents without the disease. They knew that the parents didn't have the disease. So then they narrowed down the, the, uh, the molecular changes. So then again, it doesn't need to run in the family to actually provide genetic, valuable genetic information to, uh, to, 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 uh, to discover gene uh, for Parkinson's disease. I wanted to, to highlight that. But then again, going back to the asporadic idiopathic Parkinson's disease, how do we tackle this? We know that uh, from this, the the uh, fa uh, the family history, the twin studies, we know that the Parkinson's disease between the 30, 34, 40 percent, that there is this heritability health, health part of it. How do we discover what's going on? So, and thanks to the the cheapest um, or uh, the low cost nowadays of the of the uh, sequencing or genotyping um, uh, the whole genome. Uh, now we can do these studies comparing normal samples with people with disease, but a, a, to a general population level. So now we can take hundreds and that's how we started in Parkinson. Then we moved to thousands and then now we do millions of individuals that we can sequence and understand the changes in the genome. Thanks to this, uh, we now know that there are 90 independent variants, variants uh, that they are located all over the genome. So here you have what we call a Manhattan plot. It looks better because the early designs of this without all the names, you can see that resembles the Manhattan skyline. And here you have chromosomes one to 22, and here you have, it's just as the statistical number we call the p-value. Everything above a number here that is eight, you know about that, is what we call significant, it's associated. So we have 90. But then there's a signal in the in the genome, and then depending on other concepts that I'm not going to explain now, we can extend that to many other genes that might be the real cause. So in this study in 2019, they proposed they named some of the candidate genes. 
And you can see here, many of them are really interesting um, and, and, and also uh, are part of the, uh, the order understanding of the pathophysiology of, uh, of Parkinson. Uh, but then uh, at this time, most of the research, it, 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 it was uh, this study with m including millions of people and thousands of thousands of patients. Um, it was only done in uh, Caucasians. Um, more recently, and you can see this, this was published last year. So this uh, a study added more genes to this result of what we knew already from Caucasians, including other populations, including Asians, African-Americans, uh, uh, Hispanics. So now we have a complementary assay. So this is important because now we're including not only we are included in underrepresented um, uh, populations, but this is providing more information, and this is better. Why? Because you will see in, in, a, in a moment that what we know from the patients, from all these um, uh, extensive studies that we have done in Caucasian patients, might not apply from the genetic point of view uh, to the other uh, people with other genetic background. We are, we are understanding that, um, but, but the, the, we are moving in the right direction. Um, now, from these 90 different uh, variants, we have a, a long list of genes that we can investigate and, and, and they have been investigated how they contribute. Now, the contribution of these variants to the diseases is smaller than the monogenic ones. Uh, for the monogenic forms, if you have one of those mutations, almost, for some of the cases, 100% sure you're going to develop the disease. In this case, this is a minimal contribution. Well, not minimum, minimum, but significant contribution. Now, here's one is something that is important. I don't have a figure to show you this, but this is another concept. Remember when I talk about um, risk factors and protective factors, I will say that half of these genetic factors actually reduce the risks. Nobody tells you that. Many of these factors reduce the risk for developed Parkinson's disease. So that's important because also we, we can look into explanations of targets that are not going to increase the risk, but also going to prevent the risk of developed Parkinson's disease. Now, from these genetic studies, we can now take all these different variants that are all over the, 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 the genome. And then uh, some people have come up with what we call the polygenic risk score. It's a mathematical term that combines each individual um, genetic variance with the risk that are, that attributes to the disease. And we can have now at a population level, this distribution in which we can have individuals at high risk and low risk. So this will be, this will be important for um, the next generation of clinical trials. How do we design these clinical trials? So, because then we can stratify the patients. And now we can know, even before, uh, you develop the disease, if we have the right genetic information, we can place every single individual along this uh, bell curve about uh, the risk of developing the disease. This is just the, 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 the distribution, how we can distinguish and how you can take from one population and validate it in another independent cohort, and you can still can distinguish patients from controls. So that is how uh, to demonstrate the, the power of this. Now, combining all these different variants that were identified in the initial study, we come close to the, to the explanation of the heritability between 26 and 36 um, percent of the heritability. There are still some missing, but we're still looking for it. Now, this is more recent. Um, it, it's still a preprint. It hasn't been um, peer reviewed. But then, basically, when we apply this to other uh, different uh, populations of genetic backgrounds, um, African Americans or Asians or Hispanics, then many of the findings that we can derive from these polygenic risk scores actually doesn't explain too much of the uh, genetics in those populations, suggesting that there are additional genes, additional variants that might be affecting the uh, the, uh, the the um, the risk in those populations. Now we know that with um, Alzheimer's uh, Parkinson disease, we and the genetics we can. Uh, understand different uh, areas of the disease, not only the risk, and this has been applied to the um, age of onset, it has been applied to the motor progression, has been applied to the cognitive decline, and also the continue to dementia with everybody. 
So we have now a list of different genes that are not only important for which, for whom is going to develop the disease, but also who, uh, how is that going to progress and how is that going to affect uh, different individuals? Okay, so time is moving up. This is just a summary of the progress that we have made since 1997 when uh, was discovered and the uh, uh, 2020 when uh, the latest G was, was published. But then, you know, this is the one that we have 90 different independent signals, but the promise or the, the if we follow this trajectory, more individuals involved, we can get more information. And with more information, we will be um, closer to explain all the um, the uh, heritability and also adding more genes to the uh, to the pathophysiology of Parkinson. And this is going to happen because now, along with the studies of monogenic uh, disorders, and now there is this large initiative to collect almost two hundred thousand. Um, samples from Parkinson and controls from multiple locations, from multiple, uh, uh, all the continents involve different genetic backgrounds. And this is happening. This is the report of January 2024. And so far they have 44,000 or almost 45,000 individuals already um, uh, involved in this study. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, the future is bright and this is, these are already uh, producing results. The, the updated, uh, version of the Manhattan plots that I show you is, is coming from these steps. So uh, stay tuned, more, more changes in genetic will come this year, later, later this year, early next year. Now, um, in terms of how we apply the genetics to the, to the development of targets for therapy. So uh, you, some of you are probably familiar with this. Um, this chart is basically a summary of what is in the works in the pipeline for Parkinson's disease that Kevin Marfarton put together every year since 2020. This is the update from last year. You can see here there are many um, small molecules, many drugs that are uh, in clinical, in different phases of the clinical trials. Some of them are symptomatic, some of them are disease modifying therapy. This is very important because uh, when you combine, or, or, or just, this is very important because among them, there are several molecules, several antibodies, several treatments that are actually targeting the tar uh, uh, targeting genes that have been identified through genetics. This is just to show you some a couple of studies in which um, uh, they took in the last five years. Uh, uh, they look at what were the uh, drugs that were approved by the FDA, and as you can see there, different sources. When you cross the target with the genetic information that was available. Many of them, there is almost a twofold increase of the chances that the drug is going to move from phase one to phase two to phase three, uh, depending on the genetic basis of that. And this is for many, many diseases, not only neurodegenerative diseases. This is another study that almost it did almost exactly the same, but only focused on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neuro neurological diseases. And as you can see there, is a number of trials that in the last um, 20 years, and what are the, the, the targets and what are, what, are, what are the chances of being successful? And as you can see there, you might identify some of these uh, leading uh, genes or leading targets, mostly based on genetics. And you can see there that there are many of them in Parkinson's disease. So one of the main examples, uh, one of the three that I'm gonna to talk to you today in the next few minutes is alpha synuclein. Again, as I said, in 1997, the the world of Parkinson in research and also in clinical part changed with the discovery of mutations in, in the gene called alpha synuclein. Almost two months later, after this discovery in a family in New Jersey, uh, on one single change in the um, in the genome uh, causing the, the disease in this family, it was also reported that alpha synuclein was the main component of the uh, Lewy bodies, which is, you know, as I mentioned before, one of the features of pathological Parkinson's disease. Ever since we know more about this, it's a very small protein, small, small gene, a very important. Uh, we know about function. We have created animal models uh, from flies to mouse, uh, to mice, uh, even primates. Uh, so we know the structure. We 
you seem to have an understanding of the function, but many functions, this protein that is involved in many features. It has been reported mutations, not only single, single changes, but also duplications and duplications in multiple families around the world. Uh, based on the, 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 the discovery that it was the main component of Parkinson's, uh, of the Luby body, then uh, pathologists in Japan came up with, with this uh, hypothesis that, um, uh, uh, that alpha synuclein progression or accumulation comes, comes from, the, um, from, the, from the midbrain and progresses. And now we have a pathological, uh, a pathological model of how alpha uh, the pathology part of some disease is progressing. This was 2002, and here it was proposed maybe uh, the accumulation alpha synuclein was coming from somewhere else, maybe through the vac nerve that actually goes to the gut. So another another very interesting finding was done in uh, 2008 when they were looking at the kinds of patients that receive. Uh, graft of uh, 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 stem cells in the brain. And what they realized is that these external cells that were implanted in the brains of Parkinson patients, they also developed the pathology, suggesting that there was a cell-to-cell -cell transmission of the pathology. That also moved move us to, to understand how their pathological changes of alpha synuclein, that is a protein that goes from the monomer form, one copy, to form these oligo oligomeric fibrils and other fibrils that are able then to change the conformation of the other protein. So now we have a model of how this works. And then uh, in 2014, the clinical trials started because with all this knowledge, we knew that alpha synuclein was already a target. So they developed these antibodies, humanized antibodies, to try to get rid of alpha synuclein in the brain. These are studies that were published last year. Some of them didn't match the, the endpoints to improve the, the motor, uh, to uh, stop the progression of the disease, but we are on the right track. We will learn a lot about from these trials, and I'm gonna make a comment about that. But then in the pipeline, in the uh, preclinical trials, there are many strategies to target alpha synuclein based on this initial genetic findings. Another example that I wanna to talk today is LAR2, uh, another gene. In 2004, uh, these mutations were, uh, published back-to-back -back papers in a couple of papers, very uh, seminal papers. Uh, we know now uh, that this, uh, this, is, this is a massive protein with different domains, with multiple different uh, mutations. Mutations are all over the world. Uh, it has been identified in multiple families. Now we know the, the frequency of these mutations, which is the mutation that is more important, what is the mutation that is more common. So we know that, um, well, not everything is easy. So some of the more uh, common pathogenic mutations they have this, what we call the uh, incomplete penetrance. Basically, that not, not everybody that has, well, it's likely that everybody will develop Parkinson's disease, but it might take years. So this is a pathogenic mutation. You will develop Parkinson's disease, but it depends on the years. They were also able to identify many substrates of this protein. This protein is a protein that uh, phosphorylate other proteins, just add some uh, phosphate to the other proteins. And some of these substructs we, we, we now know. It's not RAP10. It's many of these uh, RAP molecules that are very small molecules. Um, now we have an understanding after sequencing many, many, many patients of many of the mutations. And we know how many of those mutations can increase that ability of the protein to phosphorylate other targets like RAP10. So we have a way to measure um, the effect of inhibitors, the small molecules that can inhibit this activity of this gene that when it's mutated is causing the disease. So we have a target, we have a way to know, we know which mutations might cause that. So we also know that measuring in patients, I know that you probably can't see this, but um, but when measure, when we compare patients with mutations in this gene and we look at the different uh, biofluids, we identify the compound that can tell us that the gene is active and that these patients have this molecule that is, uh, uh, um, it, the levels are higher than the people without the mutation. So we know that the substrate, now we know how to track it. We also know that in, human, in humans, in additional humans, there are mutations that completely lost the function of this gene or reduce the function of this gene to 30 to 20 to 30%. 
So why not use a small molecule to reduce the function and see if we can modify the, the progression of the disease? And that's what's happening. So there are currently uh, several studies using small molecules to inhibit the, the function of uh, LR2 and are in the clinic. And we are a center for that. So if you want to be involved in this in this um, in these studies, please contact us. Uh, we have it at BNMC. The the third and last protein or last target that I'm going to talk about it is GBA, which encodes for a protein called uh, glucoserebrosidase. Ser glucose so again, so the other uh, uh, the other two targets, alpha synuclein and LAR2, were discovered by using unbiased approaches in which we look at families and we located the gene. In this case, was the observation where a group of investigators led by Ellen Sidransky at the NIH, looking at patients with another human disease that usually is present in kids. So she noticed in the family history that many of the relatives of these kids, they have Parkinson's or Parkinson. So she started looking into it. And then, you know, after <laughs> many years of uh, fighting the mainstream, uh, concept of Parkinson's disease, they developed this multi-centric international study in which they started looking at the changes in this gene, GBA1. And this is an example of multiple populations in different cohorts. So now we know that this is one of the most important genes in uh, Parkinson's disease, but also in Lewy body dementia. So, and in the, the increase in the, um, in the chances of getting Parkinson's once you have certain mutations in this gene, is higher than any of the any of the other genes. Uh, between and there are populations in which it's like 14, 40 fold, four zero. Um, now we know all, almost three hundred different mutations. They they all not have the same effect though. But but we know that. We also know as as, as I showed you here uh, the progression of the disease. These uh, individuals with this uh, disease in this case the motor progression progress faster, and they also have a uh, they develop dementia faster as well. So now we know those changes. We also know that the function of the protein, depending on when you measure it, is reduced in individuals with these mutations. So you, individuals with no mutations, individual mutations have less activity. We also know that there is, this is an enzyme that catabolizes some metabolites. And now we know that with the patients with mutations in this gene accumulate that substrate. So now we can track it. So, uh, Fortunately, because this gene was also implicated in another human disease, at the same time that this was getting established in Parkinson's disease back, back in 2009, a, 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 another group of investigators not studying Parkinson's disease did a, 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 a wide screen of compounds and identified a molecule that actually stabilized the, 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 the enzyme and improved the function. Well, um, a few years later, that molecule, which is ambroxol, which is already used in the clinic uh, as a mucolytic, uh, it was used to treat patients. And this, in 2017, was the first clinical trial to actually targeting a genetic derived uh, uh, Parkinson's disease group of, um, of individuals. Currently, uh, at BADMC, there is a, a clinical trial running uh, involving these compounds as well. Okay. So, uh, I know it's taken uh, a little bit of time, I'm almost wrapping up. Um, okay. Um, so, as a summary uh, of uh, the importance of the human genetics in clinical trials, as I've shown you some examples of how either we identify some genes, alpha synuclein, uh, GBA, or LARC2 that can stratify patients and treat them based on the genetic um, uh, features. Now, why many uh, clinical trials have failed in the past? Because we don't have the right target, because we don't have the clinical readout, because we don't have biomarkers, and because at the point, at that time, we didn't, uh, ident we didn't recognize the heterogeneity in the disease. In Parkinson, we, we have come a long way so before we have the wrong place, wrong time, and wrong people. Nowadays, with precision medicine, as just showed you an example of GBA, we are closing Parkinson's disease to make this a reality. So we have the targets, we have the understanding that we need to treat these people, 
they, they need to take the patient, the participants, way early before the motor symptoms develop. And now we have, I believe, a way, it has to be demonstrated, a way to track at least changes in alpha synuclein in different fluids that we can use as biomarker. Uh, as, a, uh, as a summary of what I have told you uh, up until now, so the time from discovery from the gene to the first uh, in humans trial is accelerating, it's getting shorter. So that's good news. So that's why I'm optimistic. Um, as a summary, you, you, you probably noticed that the best candidates that come from genetics are both found in familiar and sporadic Parkinson's disease. Um, but then again, your contribution will be um, um, a key for understanding um, which additional genes we can target. Uh, there are additional resources. We have come a long way uh, since we discovered alpha synuclein. Uh, now the technological advances we have cells that we can take from the skin or from your blood or the blood of the patients and now uh, develop dopamine neurons petri dish targeted there. We have organized that can simulate little brains. We have now the ways to high throughput screening from multiple molecules. And we are generating tons of data from Parkinson's patients by specimens to uh, recognize or to identify um, uh, uh, biomarkers that we can track not only changes in the disease, but on the progression, correlate that with clinical data. And uh, this is busy, I know, but these are efforts that currently, in fact, this was published early uh, this year, in which uh, we can take all many of the genes that we do and apply uh, 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 machine learning you know, and, and apply different different statistical models to actually identify which mo which genes we can target, um, because that information is almost available. And then there are many groups working on this, so the future is bright. Now, uh, this is just an example. I just mentioned this. This is the different advances that we have uh, with the new genes. I, I, I can I can I can bet that if we discover one of these genes these days, the the the, the time from the discovery to uh, the clinic is going to be way shorter because we have all these technologies. We have we have developed uh, mobile organisms. We can test this. But then again, we have ways to to do thousands, millions of. Uh, uh, chemical compounds, uh, repurposing of already FDA approved drugs for these different genes, and then uh, do the validation in the preclinical models and then start moving into the clinical. All of this is happening with different targets. I'm not, I today I didn't talk about the, 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 the preclinical developments, but this is happening. Uh, if I may, uh, I know it's been over time, but I wanted to get your attention to consider why you should do genetic testing. Uh, it's important, uh, it's available, it might be free, just reach out. There are, uh, as I, I listed here, different studies ongoing that can provide that for free. Uh, they might target uh, about seven of the most important genes, or if you talk to your provider, and this is this is valuable, uh, uh, there are genetic gene panels that can be tested in different individuals and provide really good information. Might not modify your treatment right now, but make, can make you a candidate if you're a patient uh, for, uh, uh, to enroll in these clinical trials in the present or in the near future. Um, then again, this is important. As a patient, you hold the key to finding the cure for Parkinson. This is the message I wanna come across. As, I, as, as you saw in the chart from uh, uh, of the many, many compounds that have been tested, we still need 17,000 individuals to participate in clinical research and clinical trials to actually uh, uh, test many of these compounds. And one of them, or some of them, might actually be the disease modifier treatment. Less than 1% 1 1 of patients actually participate in research. We can change that. As I said, I'm optimistic that the, the time for approval from the FDA can be shorter. And then the other limitation for these advances is that um, the providers or the patients are unaware of these research studies. Uh, I'm providing this information. There are many other studies locally, if, you, if you're not in, in New England or in the US, but there are many studies that you can enroll and participate, um, you, the relatives, uh, uh, in order to make this a reality. Um, at a BADMC, uh, I'm the director of the uh, uh, value repository that we started no long ago. Uh, the idea is we will explain this to you if you're interested in, in this research, but we have the capacity and the resources to actually do a thorough characterization of many of the biospecimens. We start with blood, but we can do many other things. 
uh, please reach out. Um, this is the ongoing um, um, uh, recruitment. Uh, this is accelerating uh, now that we have uh, overcome some of the hurdles. Uh, this is the people that actually make this move or this move in this forward. Happy to work with all of them. It might be one of your provider, clinical providers here. Please reach out. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, that was a, that was a lot. <laughs> a lot of information. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. You can feel free to put uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, we do have a few in there. Um, let's see. Uh, one person asked, um, thank you for the amazing information. Are there more protective factors other than those mentioned? And what are those factors? Yes, as I, as I said before, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the two thirds of the genetic variants, actually, if you look closely, they reduce the, the risk for developed Parkinson's disease. We, we don't fully understand um, we don't fully understand the molecular basis of that, but there are many um, uh, in the, uh, many uh, groups looking for what we call the resilient um, the resilient factors that make you um, um, less susceptible to the Parkinson's disease. And then um, one person asked, in the two horse race we seem to be facing, which horse do you believe will win? One, a successful strategy and course of treatment to cure Parkinson's patients, or number two, identification of genetic formula to discover an early age who is going to get Parkinson's with the plan to intercept it before it accelerates. So kind of cure versus prevention. I believe our, there are groups working on both fronts. And even before that, as I mentioned before, there are uh, strategies that includes the primary prevention, secondary prevention, and the symptomatic treatment. So uh, uh, there are, uh, again, uh, ongoing studies targeting either one or the other one. So uh, I believe that, um, that, that with the understanding that we have, and, and as I said, I tried to present to you the latest papers. This is, this is January, 2024 or December 2023, in which many of these uh, uh, developments in biomarkers, in different conceptualization of Parkinson, they might change how we design clinical trials from now, from now on. And there are many other groups uh, expanding the studies that we do in genetics. As I said, currently, the, the not only the small um, biotech companies or the pharma, many of them are uh, basing their targets on genetics. So the more information, genetic information we have, the better will be our understanding for um, for Parkinson's disease. Again, not not only for familiar Parkinson's disease, this also can be an sporadic Parkinson's disease. Um, somebody asked if you're aware of any Canadian centers that are participating yes. in genetic studies. Yes, 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 yes. I, I have many friends in Canada. Uh, and I can, I, we can provide that information, of course. Yes, yes. Oh, they're 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 wonderful. Not only clinicians, but also doing a lot of research in genetics. Yes, we can provide that information to you. And then um, a couple of questions, kind of related to family. Someone asked, just in general, can my daughter be tested? And then somebody asked, what's the childhood disease associated with a GBA mutation? Is it transmitted to offspring? Okay, so the first one, um, please contact your provider, right? Uh, your clinical provider, talk to them. Uh, as I said, depending on where you are, um, uh, uh, there are um, panels of genes that can be tested, uh, either for you or for other uh, uh, family members. One thing that I wanted to emphasize is to do the family history, regardless if it's if Parkinson has been only uh, diagnosed in, in one member of, of the family, do the effort or do the exercise of, of around the family history, and and that will uh, justify for the clinical provider if your uh, in this case daughter with daughter right can be tested as well. Yes, yes. What was the other question? Um, someone asked, "What is the childhood disease associated with a GBA mutation? Is it transmitted to oh. offspring?" 
Right. This is called Gaucher disease. Um, is a lysosomal storage disease. Is a recessive form of uh, a disease, meaning um, the both parents have to be affected for uh, the child to 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 get the disease. Uh, there are different um, uh, presentations. Not only not only when they are um, very little. Um, but also uh, different age of onsets. Um, but it's Gaucher disease. There are also treatments available for that because uh, in this case, you lose the gene, the function of the gene. So gene therapy is intended to do that. There is uh, enzyme replacement uh, therapy for, for those kids also in development. So yes, so there are multiple options to treat the um the child farm and some of them probably will be applied to um so Parkinson in the future. But in in, in this case there are um in Parkinson the understand the current understanding is that there is a reduction in the uh, in the function of the enzyme. So with ambroxol or with the small molecules we try to increase the function. So those studies are ongoing. And then um, could you also speak a little bit more um, about how information from Parkinson's research that you've gathered will tie into slowing progression or finding a cure? Right, so progression in Parkinson's disease, as I, as I briefly alluded to, it has a different genetic component. So that's because the way we measure progression. Uh, currently we are using uh, skills or uh, um, a clinical assessment um, uh, tools to uh, assess periodically if the patient has more of one symptom or the other. Uh, we do the same thing with the cognitive with the cognitive impairment. We don't have a biomarker that can actually tell us the speed of the progression. We are looking for that. The hope is that these tests that are recently developed either identify the levels of alpha synuclein or any other biomarkers can help us to track that progression. Um, sometimes this clinical assessment, it, even if the clinician is very is skillful, uh, it might vary from one um, uh, uh, clinician to another. In fact, that's one of the factors that has limited the clinical trials that are currently ongoing. For not only for Parkinson, but many other neurodegenerative diseases. And then um, suppose this is a bit of a case study question here. Somebody says, I have a LARC2 mutation. My sister has Parkinson's as well, unknown genetics. Our maternal grandmother had Parkinson's, but no one else in the family has Parkinson's. So how can this be explained genetically? Well, we have to do the studies and we have the technology to do it. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, as, I, as I alluded, it, it depends on what mutation you have in LAR2. It, it, LAR2, uh, uh, in fact, and also depends what your genetic background, because there are some mutations in LAR2 that are protected. LAR2 is an interesting gene. Um, we know a lot about a couple of uh, mutations that are um, present in one to five percent of the population, and they seem to be the ones affecting the kinase activity. Uh, but they also have this feature that um, I alluded briefly that is called the incomplete penetrance. That it with age, at most of the patients with these mutations will develop Parkinson's disease, but you might be 60, 70, have the mutation and still not have clinical Parkinson's. So if you're, if you're um, I believe the sister that has it and the grandmother has it, we have to do the, the, the family tree, the family, um, the family history, and then it's available uh, and it's free for, if, if you are in the, in, in the United States or if you are in, in, I believe in North America, although the PPMI is now in, uh, international. There are ways to, uh, to, to get this done specifically for LAR2, uh, free for you. So I, I encourage you to do the um, the molecular testing and, and, and the, all the people that is affected. 
and if it's available, if you can get the samples from them. Yeah. And then uh, someone asked, are there environmental toxins that increase the likelihood of PD gene expression? So that's a that's a that's a really interesting question. And the the interesting the interesting part is uh, we are developing models to um, understand the gene environment interaction. It's not fully clear, um, but yes, um, I, in fact, uh, it, our, our neighbors, uh, Brigham and Women Hospital, they are actually working extensively uh, on that using um, uh, what is called in, in, in inducible pluripotent stem cells derived from patients, patients with Parkinson, and they are now using many of these uh, toxins that has been identified as a risk factor for Parkinson, and then looking at the interaction in a petri dish. But also, there are uh, uh, groups in California trying to understand uh, how uh, the exposure to these um, different um, toxins uh, might affect uh, the, the risk of Parkinson's disease if also the interaction with genetics. So we're working on it. Um, I don't have a, a, a response yet, but 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 uh, trust me that uh, in the in the coming months years uh, we will have a better understanding of the gene environment interaction. And then um, somebody asked, is there any preference or sort of the difference between collecting genetic information from blood versus CSF versus saliva? As I said uh, before, um, in principle, 99% of your cells will have gene the same genetic information. So I will say no. Uh, there is no difference between um, between the information that we can gather from cells from the blood, cells from the mouth, or cells from the CSF. Now, it will be interesting if you are willing to uh, provide all of those biospecimens to a center, because then we can gather additional information, that don't, not only the genomics information. Uh, and this would be very useful as well for for future research purposes. And then um, maybe one of the last here as we start to wrap up, uh, somebody says, is there any place for artificial intelligence in your research? Yes, I, I briefly mentioned it in, in one of the uh, later uh, or the last slides. Uh, machine learning is we already using it uh, and the, the uh, moving from there to AI, it will be, it will be a no brainer, yes. Now uh, the tools are in development, uh, but 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 yes, definitely it will accelerate what conclusions we can draw from all these data because you know we we I only mentioned uh, one layer of information which is the genetics, but as I also said, we are collecting transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, along with all this clinical information, and some of the studies are adding neuroimaging. They are adding uh, additional clinical uh, assessment for sleep, for GI function, for, uh, you know, the dimension of the amount of data that we are collecting is so huge that, yes, of course, AI will be um, very useful for us to, to, um, to accelerate uh, the process to get the answers. And then um, someone asked, what is happening with ultrasound therapy? It's in the works, yes. Um, it, I haven't seen uh, recent publications, but uh, a couple of years ago, yes, um, that that was uh, those was a huge hit. Not only um, I saw it mainly for diagnosis purposes, but 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 you're right. Um, uh, and this is taken from what I have seen recently from Alzheimer, but it could also be applied to uh, uh, to Parkinson. Uh, that. Ultrasound also can help us to um, to facilitate the treatment of these disorders because um, there is this physical barrier between the blood and the brain. So ultrasound, in a very few, in a very small study, actually help to uh, facilitate the um, the amount of antibody that was. Um, 
uh, put it in the blood stream of a patient to get to the brain. And actually, this is Alzheimer. So when we get to that point uh, in which we have um, a disease modifying therapy and the leading antibodies or the leading uh, um, um, uh, treatment for that is the antibodies against alpha synuclein. So when we get to that point that we have some efficiency or efficacy, um, ultrasound uh, uh, therapy can complement that too. Yes. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A box. Um, I did put my email and phone number in the chat if anyone is interested in doing the PD generation genetic testing at BIDMC or the Department of Neurology Biorepository. Uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, we'll send out an email recap as well with uh, a link to the recording when it's posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and any last words, Dr. Benitez, this morning? Yes, so I encourage you, um, if you're a patient, if you're a, um, a caregiver, a family member, uh, or even if you are a young researcher, uh, or even if you are just interested in science, uh, uh, keep uh, stay tuned because, uh, as I said, many of the um, papers that I cited, they're very recent, and uh, the future is bright because many of these uh, studies are ongoing. We need your participation. Remember, it took one family. Well, let's put it that way. Yeah, it took one family and one group of clinicians and researchers in New Jersey in 1997 to change the, the history in Parkinson research. The discovery of alpha synuclein uh, changed us forever. It might be your family, it might be you. I also said that when, there was another example. Now that we have the technology, there is, it doesn't have to, you don't have to have a family history to, to be valuable for research. You can participate in research in clinical research, in basic research, relational research. But also remember this, we have developed many good tools, preclinical tools. And there is a cartoon that Dr. Simon shows often that says that we have cured all the mice and all the monkeys um, that we have created and treated. It's time to move to the patients. Well, we need patients, we need humans to actually validate all this research. So um, again, stay tuned, the future is bright. And uh, please, uh, uh, if you can try to participate in research, reach out and we will provide information. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, your lecture, Dr. Benitez. And thank you to everyone for spending time with us this Saturday morning. Uh, with that, I will let you all go and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend. Thank you. Thank you.